Um, we've heard some great things already today. Um, I'm not sure what else there is to say, but I, I'll try and add. Um, I think as, as farmers, you should be very excited to hear speakers talking about partnerships. So we, we heard a phrase I'd not seen before, but I, I absolutely believe in, which is co-researchers, farmers as co-researchers. And I think uh, we've just heard as, as well as farmers as co-suppliers. So if you like, both ends of the uh, supply chain are uh, wanting your involvement, and I think you have a fantastic role to play. Uh, it is an exciting industry. That's for the obvious reason that uh, we're all going to be wanting to eat and drink uh, going forward. There are going to be more people on the planet, and they are going to want more animal protein. So uh, that part of the background is really important. So let me get going. Um, I should just say I work with a, a big team in Canada, and, and this paper I'm using a lot of resu results from one of my colleagues, John Bassab. He works uh, the provincial equivalent of DARD, of the Alberta ARD, uh, but he's also uh, a, re a researcher and he has a position uh, at the university as well. Um, we're, so just a little bit of background on, on who we are. So Livestock Gentech is a, a not-for-profit center and focused on developing genomics tools for the livestock industry to improve the competitiveness of the Canadian livestock industry. Um, we are based at, uh, in Edmonton at the University of Alberta, but we are a national alliance, and so we put together uh, research programs, again, partnerships. You've heard about collaboration and partnership a lot today. They're really important in this field to build the data and then generate the information that we need to make progress. So we're all across Canada. Another exciting thing is we're, we're all, our team is all, from all around the world. I think that's really important. It makes it exciting to go to work and hear different views, but we get different experiences and different inputs to the research we're doing. But the stars also represent not just the origin of individuals in the team, but also the groups that we work with around the world. And, and getting the uh, numbers of animals we need and the data that we need to drive this technology, it is a global effort. And I think there was a slide that already mentioned the 1,000 Bulls project. That's a, uh, an international effort, to, or the 1,000 Bull Genome Project, to sequence a thousand bulls across the world. Um, okay. So today, I, my task was to talk a little bit or show you some examples of the research we're doing in terms of genetics and uh, feeding strategies. And I'll try and cover all of these different things on here. I won't read them. Uh, not necessarily in, in this order. But the, I suppose one of the the good things is about looking at the cost of production in terms of how much feed these, the animals eat. Is It's a little bit like uh, having your cake and eating it because if we look at some of the things that people are looking for now is feed efficiency goes in the same direction as reducing the environmental footprint and the amount of greenhouse gas that is produced particularly from ruminants. So they're going in the same direction, which is great news, of course. Okay, so I, I am going to talk about genomics. I'm also going to talk about some results. But why now, I guess, is the, is the question. And one of the answers is that the challenge we have in the next um, 35 years of doubling food production. Now, we've, we did that in the last 50 years, so it's definitely doable, but of course we have more challenges now. We have uh, less land, less resources, climate change, less water. All of these things are going to make it harder, but it should be within our reach, especially if we use all of the technologies that are available to us. And I think the other important thing uh, there's several of these I could put up, but is if we look at demand, meat is on the menu. And the first of those two uh, slopes, and this is from 
an economist article, those, the highest of those slopes is the growing demand for uh, animal protein or meat protein in that particular case. The second one is dairy. So animal proteins are number one and two, and the others are cereals and pulses. So the demand, because of the movement in the developing world into the middle classes, uh, they're going to want better diets, healthier children, and meat is going to play an important role. And so those of us in the red meat industry should be excited about the opportunities that we will have. Okay, so, and the other thing is, in terms of genomics and really getting at not just looking at an animal's physical appearance, but understanding its genetic potential and what we can do with that animal, the cost of doing that is changing. And it's changing remarkably, even faster than computing did. And so we think of this as being the age of the genome sequence. So I'll very quickly show you that. So when people... This was the genomic equivalent of putting the man on the moon. When we decided we needed to sequence the human genome, that started in 1990. Um, and the aim was to be able to decode the three billion letters that are in each copy of the genome. And we know from some of the mutations we have in animals that one change in that three billion base pair sequence can have a remarkable impact on the phenotype. But if we could understand uh, that sequence and the 21,000 genes or 20,000 genes that it makes up, we'd be able to make some different uh, decisions. And, of course, we think of that in terms of personalized medicine in the human area. So in 13 years, and we say it was completed, but it's an ongoing exercise, so 13 years and $4 billion to sequence the human genome. So, and that's just over 10 years ago. So the first, this was the cover of Science in 2009, the first um, Hereford cow was sequenced and published at a cost of around $50 million, and it took about four years. A big international effort. Many of the people in Alberta were part of that effort. Um, and then by 2010, we'd gone from more... Um, being able to do these things as an international effort to, in our lab, we sequenced the first two Canadian bulls, an Angus and a Holstein bull, and we did it in six months at the cost of $100,000. So you get the idea now. And then we were the first people to sequence a Bos indicus bull, same time, but $20,000. And then the Canadian Cattle Genome Project Last year, in that 12-month period, we sequenced 300 bulls. In fact, I think we're up to 382 now. So the biggest contribution to this international effort to sequence 1,000 uh, bulls at a cost of $2,500 for each bull. So I think you're getting the picture. Ge the genomics tools are not going to be the issue. I, I may forget to say this. But to make use of all this, of this information... It's measuring the phenotypes that are important on the animals and the, the meat that comes from those animals, measuring those phenotypes and using this technology and developing some of those solutions that Stephen uh, was talking about that could come from Bovis and using that integrated data. That's the challenge. But with co-research and working together, whether that's working together within Ireland, or whether it's working uh, together. In our case, we're very interested in pooling our resources in terms of feed efficiency to work with groups like AFBI and uh, find ways of being able to select and improve the cost of production of, of beef. Okay, and that's declining, and it will get later on. I have a slide that I think it's in your pack where within 10 years, getting the whole genome sequence will be uh, $100 per animal. Now, $100 per animal is still a lot, but I can tell you we're even there today. By sequencing um, 1,000 bulls, we can actually 
um, extrapolate from gene chips, and you've seen some pictures of gene chips, to full sequence. Because we've now sequenced enough animals, we can take a snapshot of that genome sequence and we can predict the whole sequence of the animal. And that costs about $50, $50 I guess, maybe 50 pounds. So we're already there. I mean, it's not really sequencing the genome, but in agriculture, because we've put together all of this information and we're starting to think of how to use it in a different and uh, clever way, we're already able to deliver that promise of a $100 uh, genome. Okay, and the reason we're doing it is by understanding uh, these genetic variants, then we can begin to improve our breeding efforts for these what we often call difficult to measure traits. We can measure feed efficiency in cattle, but it's expensive and it takes a long time. We can measure longevity. We heard longevity mentioned by Francis uh, this morning, but of course, if you want to measure, if you want to determine longevity, you have to do it for a long time, right? We, we haven't got uh, time machines yet. But having done that, what essentially we're trying to do is build up data sets where we can then use the DNA of an individual, the DNA fingerprint of an individual, to predict the longevity or the uh, tenderness or the taste of, of the beef that's going to be eaten by uh, consumers. Uh, the other thing is, if we, um, if we do understand some of these genes, then we can begin to do what we sometimes call uh, marker-assisted management or genome-assisted management, or take us into the interesting area of precision agriculture in terms of livestock. So knowing what the potential of that animal is, how it's going to respond to the different management uh, practices or the different environments we can uh, put that animal in and begin to select for the right genotype, for the right environment, for the right management, and for the right markets, of course. Okay, so our role at, at Gentech nowadays is converting that DNA sequence or that variation between individuals and taking, doing it on thousands of animals and converting that into information. The same as Bovis is doing, taking all of this raw data and creating information from it. So that's the challenge. And the good news is we in... Um, in our systems, we're interested in identifying, and we, we might have reasons for doing that in different ways. In Alberta, it was an exciting place to go to. In 2007, every uh, calf that is born is tagged. And so it's followed through life, and we have the equivalent of bovis. We can get our camera data from the plants. We can take that information, and if we also collect a, a DNA sample at the same time, we have the means of linking that information to the genetics. And if we do that, of course, we get traceability. Uh, we've heard about that. But it also allows you to uh, calibrate to validate the research findings and to demonstrate the value that you can deliver by uh, selecting for different genotypes. So just this simple thing of putting a, an ear tag into a, a calf, collecting a piece of DNA, it delivers all of this benefit. So why wouldn't we do it? But there are still people who are resistant to this sort of thing, that's good, big brother or whatever it is. But the benefits are tremendous. It's about sharing information. I forgot to say, when we talk about supply chains, what makes a chain work, if we think back to the days of when we rode our bicycles, is oil is what makes the chain work, right? If you don't oil the chain, it seizes or whatever. And the oil here is sharing information, and we just heard the last speaker talking about some of those aspects. Sharing that information, but also generating and sharing value across the chain. If that value is not uh, shared from the top to the bottom and 
oil that chain, it won't work. So this is one of the systems, I think, that can uh, help drive that integration. So just simply what we do is we collect as much data on as many animals as we can. We run these SNP chips, and then we do an association uh, between the phenotypes and each SNP on those chips and end up with a prediction. Easy to say, much harder to, to do, of course. And the real value is not doing the easy things, which are growth rate, which are e easy to measure, or something, a coat color, I suppose, are easy to see, uh, but other traits such as feed intake in the case of cattle or health are some animals more susceptible to diseases? If they are, let's find them and let's select for animals which are more or less susceptible. So those are the traits that can really uh, benefit from this technology. And in terms of marker-assisted management, here we have some, uh, some Canadian cattle. I know the Canadian because they have that snow blanket. And people keep asking me, well, you know, how much of the year do you have them in houses? Well, they, they don't, they're not in houses, okay? <laughs> we keep them outside. Um, but what we want to know is, what's the best use of these animals? When we, when we feed, of course, we feed most of our cattle. When we send them to the feedlot, what is each of those animals, what's the best return we're going to get? Is it that most of the animals going into grind? Is it going to go to your favorite steak restaurant? What is going to be the best return? And if it's going to, to be in the mints, the convenient mints, then maybe you want to produce that in a different way to some of the other products. So by Understanding the potential of the animals, we can target them to different markets and different production systems. Okay, so just another plug. If you didn't already believe me, here's one of the world's top business consultancies, uh, McKinsey from last year, looking at 12 disruptive technologies. And in the middle here is the technology I've just been talking about. Uh, and the statement that it's going to impact every industry, but especially agriculture. And it really is. It's here today. We're using it today. And you will see more and more use of this technology in the future. OK. So now to switch gears a little bit, I might, I might come to genomics at the end. But how do we make beef cows more efficient? And we have. Even before I was in, in Canada, uh, John was uh, leading this effort to measure individual feed intake and be able to look at what that meant and how we could reduce the cost of production and the environmental footprint of cattle. It's a big effort, but it's paying dividends now because, as I've told you, you have to have lots of this data to be able to make this new technology work. OK, and some of these things I've already uh, talked about. Here's uh, the impact it could have in uh, Alberta. So 5% improvement in this trait of feed efficiency and a 30% adoption rate in Alberta, where we would be looking at a return of $100 million annually. OK, so again, more of that cake and eating it. The other great thing is, of course, we keep ruminants and, and they use materials that are not part of what we eat. They can be grown on um, forage and they do a great job of that. We do, sometimes we feed them on uh, uh, grain as well. But, so that's one good thing, they can be raised in areas that are not competing with directly with uh, products that we can eat. But the second thing is, compared to, and I think uh, Sam was talking about this, talking about pigs flying. No, he didn't say pigs flying. He said chickens flying away. I said yesterday their breasts are too big to fly, Sam. But the, um, the fact is, 
The other industries have made huge progress in uh, feed efficiency. The footprint of agriculture is, is much lower. But we haven't really done anything in ruminants. So that's a fantastic opportunity. So we can address this. In this case, we're looking at the impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but it's also true if you just come back to the basic trait of feed efficiency. So that's great news. We're beginning to get the tools and we have the opportunity to change how we produce our product. And um, many people like John Basab and some of the uh, people before him have been looking at all of the different biological mechanisms that contribute to feed efficiency. Um, where are we? One of them is a sort of heat increment. As you, you can imagine, maintenance energy, keeping those animals going. If you lose more heat, you're um, less efficient. But there are many different routes to getting there. So it's a complex uh, problem. So what we begin, began to do, and I should just plug here, um, GrowSafe, which is a, an Albertan company, has been manufacturing um, the equipment that allows us, using RFID tags, to measure individual meals, measure the growth or the feeding beha behavior of animals, and begin to look at this, uh, this trait of feed efficiency. Uh, we take into account many different aspects, and you can see now grow safe capacity, at least a couple of years ago around the world, 68,000 um, animal places are dotted around the world beginning to collect this information. And I just wanted to show this slide for those of you who think you can tell a, an efficient cow from an inefficient one. Here's a nice example from one of our uh, co-researchers, uh, William Torres, who manages a big uh, contract feedlot in um, eastern Alberta. And from some uh, presentation he gave at our conference uh, last year. So here you have uh, two animals. They had a similar uh, starting weight. Um, and here you can see, um, where are we? You can see their average daily gain on test. And you can see um, somewhere, uh, OK, it doesn't say. So it was 77 days. And they essentially grew to the same weights. But the important thing was how much they ate. And you can see here that one of those steers ate 485 pounds less feed than the other one. So very different actual performance of those animals. And uh, from some of the things we've done, we can begin to take the data and play a little bit with it. So here, you can see from some of our results in, in a trial we did, we decided to, to sort, and I think you saw that in, in, I think it was Francis who showed the trial where you had the high and lows. So we're filling pens of uh, cattle, 200 cattle in each pen, and here we're taking the, the top 600 and the bottom 600 from our data and looking at how much feed would be used uh, to feed those animals. And it's a big difference. So, of course, we multiply it up to match the pile of barley here. But uh, 10,000 market-ready feeders, if we use this comparison, nearly 500 tons less barley to produce those efficient animals. So a big difference. Something even now, we can put in uh, a pen of 200 animals, we can easily see how much pen, uh, how much each pen ate, and be able to uh, the feedlot producer would be able to see the difference. We can demonstrate this technology. Okay, but of course we we feed them, but in terms of cost and in terms of the the impact on the environment, the cow herd is more important. Uh, because that's the production, if you like, the, the vehicle that's producing these calves. And so we've looked at, okay, if we measure 
efficiency in the feedlot, is it translating to efficiency with the cows? Uh, and so we've been studying that. Here I hope you can see um, two sets of animals from two years. And the, I forgot to tell you, but uh, low RFI or a negative value is better. Um, and you, I hope you can see here that um, looking at these grazing animals, in each year, uh, the ones that were identified as being the most efficient, when they're grazing, they're using less forage as well. So they're really efficient in grazing as well as in the finishing phase, okay? So these traits are related. Maybe they're not, the correlation may not be one, but they are related. And then um, the, one of the other things we can do is to actually measure directly the methane being produced by these animals. In this case, we're using uh, what are called open path lasers, and we, we set them up in strip grazing, and we're able to, it remar sounds remarkable, but it's really true, we can measure the methane in the atmosphere upstream of a group of cattle, and then we can measure it downstream of the cattle and detect the production of methane by those cattle. And I hope you can see in the next slide that again, if we look at, and it's the, the inefficient ones are the red ones here, and again, looking over this four-day, five-day period, I hope you can see that the actual emission of methane from these animals is less with the, if the animals that have been identified as being more efficient. So as I told you, greater feed efficiency means that we're producing less methane. So it's good news. The other thing I wanted to uh, show you again, uh, coming to uh, this relationship between RFI that we're measuring and the performance of the cow herd. Uh, here we're looking over time um, over the age of these cows, again measured for RFI here and then uh, going through their lives, here where they begin what we call swath grazing and you can see them pushing the snow away and finding their uh, forage, is that the efficient cows are maintaining their body condition much better than the inefficient cows. So I hope you can see that we think these efficient cows are much more adaptable to these stressful conditions and are the sort of cows that we need uh, to be producing our calves in Canada. Okay, so I'm running out of time. I just want to very quickly tell you that it's not just about the cow. Also, of course, the rumen is incredibly important and we're beginning to look with, again, these same DNA sequencing tools. We can look at the what's called the metagenome or the microbiome of the rumen, and many of those organisms are unculturable or difficult to culture, and we can begin to find differences, and those differences correlate with efficiency. So the rumen microflora are contributing, and some of that is down to the host, so the host is driving what microbes are in the rumen, but you can imagine selecting those healthy bacteria or whatever we call them in yogurts uh, and being able to manipulate feed efficiency through that route. And I guess I should just talk about some of Dan Beretta's work at the University of Alberta working with DSM. And here is an example of a feed ingredient. This is a dairy trial, so there's an adaptation period. And then we're collecting and looking at different aspects, including milk production and methane. And here are some of the results. You can see that whilst body weight was better with the treatment, um, methane production is reduced. And not surprisingly, when we look at the microbiome, the methanogens in the rumen are reduced. And so more of the energy that's in the rumen is going into the host, increasing the body weight and having an impact on the amount of methane that's produced by cattle. And this research is going on to see if we can see similar things in beef cattle, of course. Okay, so my conclusions. 
Um, there are different options, many different options. Uh, we've heard a little bit about sustainability. Here's a definition coming from the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, an initiative that's been driven in many respects by McDonald's uh, in Canada in terms of producing uh, beef for their uh, restaurant chains, which they can call more sustainable. Many different options. You won't be able to read this, but a 100-mile diet raised without antibiotics and hormones, many different choices, and, of course, based on the sort of information that Bovis and other systems can generate. Um, and this is another colleague of John Basov, Susan Marcus, who's developing information that we can use um, with producers, very much like Caffrey is doing. Uh, I guess I've run out of time, so I've delivered most of my messages I think what I would say is where we are is from looking at a cow on the sort of TV that I remember seeing Neil Armstrong walk, walk on the moon. It was, I could kind of see the man in a white suit, I guess, uh, and I knew it was a man and I suppose it was the moon, but that's what we used to be able to do when a cow is born. But now with genomics, we know it's going to have these horrendous horns, it's going to be producing the sort of beef that you want to eat from your favorite uh, restaurant, etc., etc. So I'll end there. I'm very, I, you know which of these I am. I hope many of you in the audience will go away encouraged and be excited about the industry you work in and what we can do for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>